In 2000, average GDP per capita in the UK was over three times that of Poland. But with the UK economy stuck in a trap of low growth, a forecast suggests that by 2035, Polish wages could exceed that of the UK. In terms of raw size, the UK economy will still be bigger, but the gap is narrowing. But the important thing is that on current trends, Polish wages could be higher than the UK. Just last decade, nearly 1 million Polish workers came to the UK looking for higher wages. But within another 10 years, that could be reversed completely. What explains such a remarkable turnaround? Well, firstly, it reflects good news. Eastern European economies, such as Poland, have been successful in catching up with Western Europe. And it's worth bearing in mind that an economy like Poland has had lost decades of communism, where there were some relatively easy gains from productivity by changing the inefficiency of the past. Another reason for Poland's remarkable growth is that it has been successful in attracting foreign capital to transform industry and become a key player in global supply chains. It's also benefiting from a current desire to reduce our reliance on China and bring manufacturing closer to Europe. Poland's success can be best seen in the motor industry, where it has been able to compete not just on low wages, but increasingly through high-tech innovation, developing high-value uh, batteries and engines. So it is now a major player in the global car industry. Poland's transformation has also been helped by membership of the European Union. It's been one of the biggest receivers of EU aid. In 2021, it received over 11 billion euros, helping it to be the biggest recipient. Now, we should bear in mind that this prediction is based on Poland maintaining an economic growth rate of 3.8% that it's managed in recent years. Things, of course, could change. For example, access to the EU funds could be curtailed by the political interference of a governing party in the courts. Poland is also heavily dependent on the German economy, with 28% of Polish exports going to its near neighbour. And as the German economy slows down, it will have a negative effect on Poland. And like many other countries, Poland has also been heavily reliant on Russian gas and is struggling to make the transition. But whatever challenges the Polish economy faces, the UK could only dream of an economic growth rate anything close to 3.8%. Since 2009, UK growth has averaged just above 1%. And seeing the latest forecasts from the Bank of England, even that looks optimistic in the medium term. Now, the recent malaise of the UK economy has several causes. But let's go back to the early 1980s and 1990s. North Sea oil was an important source of growth, raising tax revenues and a focus for research and development. In the early 80s, high prices and high output led to a North Sea oil tax bonanza. It led to a surge in the value of a pound, which unfortunately made exports less competitive, hitting UK manufacturing. The UK had a mild case of Dutch disease, with the oil industry crowding out the rest of the economy. Also, we could compare the UK with Norway. Uh, in Norway, the, their oil bonanza they saved, they put in a global pension fund, uh, whereas the UK, we used it to cut income tax in the 80s. But since the early 2000s, the UK production of North Sea oil has gone into terminal decline. It's fallen dramatically. And by the way, Rishi Sunak's recent promise to increase output from the North Sea is more symbolic than practical. There just isn't very much oil left in the North Sea. Now, even though oil declined in the 1990s and 2000s, the UK economy was boosted by the growth of the finance sector. The Big Bang of the late 1980s saw London become one of the most deregulated financial markets and a main centre of global finance. London benefited from a rush of new financial instruments, such as derivatives and credit default swaps. But the success of London as a global financial centre made the UK economy reliant on both finance and the City of London. And so when the financial crisis hit the global economy in 2008, London was particularly exposed. And the rapid growth in finance went into a decline and a major source of income tax revenue fell for several years. And it was no coincidence that after 2009, the UK started to see the big fall in productivity 
and low economic growth. Before 2009, growth was good. After 2009, growth has been anemic. Also in 2008, due to the credit crisis really hitting the UK economy, the UK experienced a massive devaluation, 30% in the value of the sterling. Now in theory, that should make exports cheaper and boost manufacturing. But despite this uh, boost to competitiveness, industrial output continued to decline and remain weak. And throughout the 2010s, investment was uh, poor, further hit by Brexit in 2016. It left the UK with one of the lowest levels of investment in the OECD. The problem with a strong oil and finance sector is that it can minimise investment and growth elsewhere, a kind of crowding out effect. However, whilst this is part of a long term puzzle, we shouldn't overstate their role. A lot more is going on too. In 2008, the credit crunch hit UK tax finances hard because the finance sector was a big source of income tax revenue. And so a major feature of a 2010 election was a Conservative plan to reduce budget deficits. And this led to the austerity of the 2010s, with very limited public sector investment and low growth in government spending, particularly hitting public sector wages, which has lagged even the uh, low growth in private sector wages. Austerity contributed to the slowdown in economic growth and low investment. And with interest rates close to zero, it was a real missed opportunity for investment uh, into bottlenecks in the UK economy like housing, transport and energy. And the unfortunate thing about the 2010s is that the very low interest rates did not stimulate capital investment, but investment in property and assets. And so the UK has been very good at growing wealth, but not good at growing income. Now, at least two reasons for the Brexit vote in 2016 were high levels of immigration from Eastern Europe and the stagnation in wages, which occurred since 2009. And it was easy to make a loose association between the two. However, if anything, the nature of Brexit we've had has only added to the UK's economic problems, with both a significant rise in uncertainty and also new trading rules, making it difficult for British exporters and importers who have now higher costs and more frictions. And ironically, many British firms have sought to relocate at least part of their operations in the single market and Poland has been actively courting British firms to move there. Since 2016, we've had two major shocks, Covid and the Ukraine war. But even accounting for that, the UK has done relatively worse with uh, very low wage growth compared to our main competitors. Now recently, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt claimed that since 2010, UK economic growth has been the third best in the G7. Now this is true, but needs context. Since 2010, UK real GDP growth has been faster than European economies, helped in no small part by the uh, EU debt crisis of 2012. However, if we adjust the population, the effect is much reduced. In other words, part of the UK real GDP growth is due to rising population. But for wages, what counts is GDP per capita growth. And if we look at uh, productivity growth, the output per worker, the UK is the worst in the G7. So higher real GDP has been caused by rising population and people working longer hours, not something we can maintain forever. Productivity is a key to real wage growth. And if productivity is flat, so will real wage growth. And the problem is that with all the problems and low confidence at the moment, it's hard to see an immediate solution to the UK's low productivity growth. For example, since the pandemic, the UK has had the largest rise in labour market inactivity, with bad health affecting labour supply and labour productivity, something that's very difficult to fix. Now, it should be said that the long term prediction for Poland to overtake UK wages by 2035 is speculative at best. Also, for context, on current growth rates, Poland would also overtake several other European countries, not just the UK. Secondly, predicting economic growth rates is difficult for next year, let alone 10 years in advance. Despite all its short term problems, the UK could still find a way to break out of its low growth and low productivity trap. Similarly, despite all the current strength of the Polish economy, it's no guarantee to last. But equally, if the UK malaise continues, it could even happen quicker in 2035. But in the long term, we would expect a narrowing of wage differentials between similar countries 
the geographical proximity. And by the way, this is a good thing. Economics is not a zero-sum game. The UK benefits from a strong Polish economy. It is an opportunity, not a threat. Now, in recent years, the UK has definitely had quite a few self-inflicted wounds, and this has accelerated the convergence of per capita incomes. But it does lead to an interesting um, scenario. If Polish and UK wages become similar over time, free movement of labour may seem much more attractive and less of a barrier to rejoining the single market in the future. If you found this video useful, do check out this one and how falling house prices might affect you and the wider UK economy. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and see you soon.